Hello, I'm Ray Suarez. It was an administrative perfect storm. The Vietnam veterans are hitting their years of highest need in health care, just as the client rolls are swelling with hundreds of thousands of people who fought in America's latest wars, in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's long been known inside and outside the vast veterans' health care system that wait times for care could be long, backlogs were enormous, and it was promised over and over again in congressional hearings that the Department of Veterans Affairs understood its problems and would take care of them. And they did, or said they did. In some sectors, the patient care has improved. The backlog of cases and the waits for an appointment or treatment did get better. While in poor performing regions, they reportedly hit their targets by cooking the books, by manipulating the dates recorded between the time a vet asked for treatment and when he actually got it. Now Congress is looking at dysfunction in the enormous veterans' health care system and summoned the cabinet secretary in charge, retired General Eric Shinseki, to testify. Veterans Affairs Secretary General Eric Shinseki promised the Senate committee overseeing the VA he would get answers to the recent allegations of secret waiting lists at veterans' hospitals. Any adverse incident like this um, makes me as makes me mad as hell. I could use stronger language here, Mr. Chairman, but in deference to the committee, I won't. But at the same time, it also saddens me. The former four-star Army General Shinseki has been under pressure now for weeks. I ask the secretary to submit his resignation, and I ask President Obama to accept that resignation. A veteran's health care system in Phoenix may have gamed the reporting while delaying treatments, and those delays may have caused more than 40 deaths. The charges underscore a crisis in the veterans' benefits system. Shinseki says he's worked tirelessly to cut bureaucracy and address backlogs. Over five years, we've enrolled uh, two million more uh, veterans. We didn't simply go after the backlog just to end uh, what was then, five years ago, a, a set of claims. We also acknowledge that we hadn't done very well by veterans of previous conflicts. But some veterans disagree, saying it's common to wait weeks for an appointment. One of those vets is Mark Craney, whose unit in Vietnam was exposed to Agent Orange, a chemical that can cause severe nerve damage. Well, there's promises, there's out and out promises from the military that they would care for us. Last spring, Craney's doctor recommended an urgent operation to treat his glaucoma. It was probably at least four months before I got to see the VA eye doctor. By the time he got the surgery, it was too late. I can't read, I can't see street signs. Um, I, it is, I can see colors and shapes. I can't see much in low light. In San Antonio, Texas, one Veterans Affairs scheduling clerk came forward to Al Jazeera America and said he was ordered to hide patient wait times. There are a number of clerks that would substantiate the scheduling uh, that I have claimed in the coaching of us changing those dates to make it look like the VA had a shorter wait time. Senate Veterans Affairs Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders pressed General Shinseki at the hearing, asking if an institutional cover-up is in effect right now, and if it's part of a larger culture problem at the VA. But this is not new news, that this is not new news that these concerns did not arise yesterday, they did not arise in Phoenix, but in fact, there have been reports by the Inspector General, by the General Accounting Office, on numerous occasions about problems having to do with scheduling and with waiting lists. But Shinseki insisted that as a wounded Vietnam veteran himself, he would not stand for gaming if it's true. The standard practice at the VA seems to be to hide the truth in order to look good. That has got to change once and for all, and I want to know how you're going to get your medical directors and your network leaders to tell you, whether it's through this survey or in the future, when they have a problem and will work with you to address it, rather than pursuing these secret lists and playing games with these wait times. Well, Senator, if there's anything that gets me uh, 
angrier than just hearing allegations is to hear you tell me that we have folks that can't be truthful because they think the system doesn't allow it. Right. Uh, you know, trust is an important aspect of everything we do here, and has been in my previous life as well. And in order to do that, uh, we have to be transparent, and, uh, and we have to hold people accountable. Shinseki also said only President Barack Obama could convince him to give up his post, helping all wounded veterans. Do you believe uh, that you're ultimately responsible for all this? I intend to continue this uh, uh, mission until uh, I've satisfied either that uh, uh, goal or uh, uh, I'm told by, by the commander in chief that my time has uh, been served. The president has assigned Rob Neighbors, one of his closest advisors, to oversee a review of Veterans Affairs policies. The result of an audit by the inspector general of the VA is expected in the coming weeks. Secretary Shinseki, as we mentioned, is a retired four-star general and former chief of staff of the Army. He's rejected calls to resign and pledged in interviews to get to the bottom of the systemic problems at the VA. What is it that's plaguing this key and politically sensitive federal government operation? That's this edition of Inside Story. To help us look inside the medical system, now responsible for the care of millions of men and women, we're joined by Louis Chelly. The legislative director of the American Legion, Lawrence Korb, a Vietnam veteran and senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and Richard Allen Smith, a veteran of the war in Afghanistan and former VA staff member. Louis Chelly, let me start with you. You saw Senator Sanders open his questioning by saying, this is not new news. Hasn't the Department of Veterans Affairs promised to roll up these problems when they've erupted in the past. Ray, that's correct. And, and the American Legion has been tracking this issue for many years. We've testified it on several, testified about it on several different occasions. We brought it up in the past. And, and when the Phoenix scandal hit, that's when the American Legion finally decided to speak out. It wasn't because of Phoenix. It was because of a systemic breakdown in the leadership of the Department of Veteran Affairs. As a matter of fact, the American Legion had come out strongly to defend Secretary Shinseki just a year ago through a Time Magazine article that called for his re resignation. And the American Legion stepped up and said, no, we think that he's doing some good things. We want to give him a little bit more of an opportunity to fix these problems. And then when these scandals started to break out, we, we finally had to reassess and, and our leadership got together. They voted and our members decided that it was really time for new leadership at the Department of Veteran Affairs. According to your own investigations at the American Legion, it's not just Phoenix, is it? It's several other centers as true. well. True. It's true. It's not just Phoenix. And the other centers now, in addition to our investigation, have come out on their own. There have been several whistleblowers across the country. Now that Phoenix is broke and the American Legion has spoke out, it's encouraged other whistleblowers to come forward. Lawrence Korb, uh, not only did you serve in uniform, but you're a former Assistant Secretary of Defense. You know about big operations, big institutions, and big systems. Is fixing the Veterans Administration as easy as sometimes congressional hearings make it sound? No, it's not. <clears throat> and you've got to remember that when we went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, we thought those wars were going to be short. Uh, the administration called them a cakewalk. Uh, when General Shinseki, then General Shinseki said, you know, it's going to be a long war, you need a lot of troops. They said he doesn't know what he's talking about and basically sidelined him. So General Shinseki's been playing catch-up ball because since we didn't uh, plan for the long wars, nor did we plan for what we call, you know, mental problems or PTSD, uh, the numbers were much greater than they, than they thought. And then, of course, as your, the run-up pointed out, us old Vietnam veterans are getting older and we're coming in so the two came together and I think if you take a look at it he has reduced the number of claims that he inherited he has reduced the waiting times we'll, we need an IG an inspector general investigation to find out if these were individuals who were acting on orders or were basically worried about their own own careers and I think that's what we need to find out before we say you should go I mean you know, for example, we didn't ask the Secretary of Defense to resign when that Walter Reed scandal came out in 2007. Uh, Richard Smith, 
tell us what it was like actually getting care. You're one of those new generation of veterans flooding through the doors, looking for help for a variety of problems. Was it easy to use the system? Yeah, it was for me. Um, and I think one thing that needs to be clear, and American Legion testified this on the Hill, no one is, is criticizing the quality of care uh, delivered by the Department of Veterans Affairs. What we have here is a problem of access to that care. And, um, so once you get in, you're okay. Yeah, and, and again, and there's, it depends on where you are. I, I took a friend to a VA emergency room in Pittsburgh once, and we walked in, and he was seen right away. When I was uh, um, in Denver, Colorado, and Birmingham, Alabama, it was really easy to see someone. Here in Washington, D.C., it's taken a little bit, little bit longer. What I think it is important here is that when General Shinseki came in in 2009, there was an uh, immediate culture shift at VA, right? Um, General Shinseki, from my time there, he's the guy that wants to know what's wrong, and he wants to know how wrong it is so he can fix it. For decades, the Department of Veterans Affairs was mismanaged, and the number one priority was making things look good, not making things good. And I think that there are a lot of people, especially at the RO level, on the benefits side, and the hospital level, um, on the health side, that are either you know, unwilling to change or, or just don't know any other way of doing business, who don't get that you know, this is the kind of, making things look good is the kind of thing that's going to get you in trouble rather than telling the boss that things aren't good. Louis Jelly, what about that? That this is um, a really regional and limited problem that's limited to certain centers where care is given, but overall satisfaction is high with the product once you get through the door. Well, I think the American Legion absolutely agrees with that. These are, these are systemic problems that are peppered throughout the United States. If you ask the average veteran, and we have, we conduct town halls all over the United States, and we ask veterans, what do you think about your VA care? By and large, 95% of the veterans that we poll and survey love their VA care. They love their care team. They love their doctors. It's not the VA care that we're most concerned about. There are some, there are some issues. Uh, in some sporadic pockets around the country, for instance, the, uh, the colonoscopies, dirty equipment with uh, uh, dental care. There are some problems that are, that are isolated that happens in any large uh, uh, health administration. Our chief complaint is with the administration of this health care. It's not with the health care itself. It's with trying to get care. It's with, it's with the wait times. Uh, we also have some problems with the construction of the hospitals. We've got problems with uh, the electronic records that was abandoned between DOD and VA. So there are a lot of systemic breakdowns that we have issues with. We're going to take a short break right now and when we come back we'll talk about whether that's a legitimate answer, this new flood of veterans, and what it would take to get the VA where it needs to be to handle both the vets of the past and the newest former service people. This is Inside Story. Welcome back to Inside Story. I'm Ray Suarez. Unnecessary deaths, long waits for treatment, falsified records to cover up mismanagement. Serious charges have been brought against the Veterans Administration. We're looking inside the sprawling health system for America's veterans. And Louis Chelley, uh, you heard Larry Korb just a moment ago talk about the unfunded and unintended size of the patient pool now. Is that a legitimate answer from the VA for why it's been so tough to ramp up to where the system needs to be, in your view? Absolutely not. No, and no one, the American Legion is not saying that the VA doesn't have a tough job and that there aren't a lot of veterans to serve. We've never said that. Our complaint is that the VA has consistently sat before Congress and said, hey, we've got everything under control. We've got this. And, and veterans are getting an appointment within 14 days and everything is good. And, the, and, the, and Congress keeps coming back and saying, are you sure? Because we'll give you more resources if that's what you're looking for. And they say, no, we're good. But the truth of the matter is that they're hiding a wait list. So the question now becomes, if they open that hidden wait list and they dump everybody into the system, will the VA then be overrun? Will they, will they then say, we just don't have enough resources to see all these veterans. It's arguable they're overrun now. In the last three years, primary care visits rose by 50%, and the number of doctors on staff to handle them rose by 9%. Isn't that a gap that simply can't be closed? It sounds like a gap that can't be closed until you hear from the VA and they say, we're handling it just fine. So it sounded like they were managing their assets in such a way as to compensate for the increased uh, uh, 
Secretary Shinseki said there were 2 million more, but then he later said in his testimony that 1.4 actually came in for services after they registered. So he's got another million and a half veterans that need to be seen. We believe that they're being taken care of. We come to find out that they're not. That's what we're upset about. Richard, um, is this more than just a, um, a bureaucratic inconvenience, but something more like a breach of faith, something that young fellas like yourself are depending on to be there and then finding it's not all it was cracked up to be? I think so, yeah. Um, but I think, again, it's key to remember that, that look, the VA was mismanaged for decades. Um, and that's hard to describe to someone who hasn't experienced that environment but we're talking epic levels of mismanagement that you can't turn around in six years so um, i think yeah there is some accountability that needs to be happened for going to congress and saying yes we're handling this fine we have 14 day waiting periods um, but if there's still a culture at the bottom that's reporting up the chain that yes we've got it under control uh general shinseki i mean what's he going to do but go and say yes we got it under control his subordinates are but i'm really asking that. about um when you're transitioning out of uniform is part of the mindset for demobilizing vets coming off of multiple tours in Afghanistan, multiple tours in Iraq, that, yes, I know because I've been promised that that's waiting for me. Absolutely. And when I got out of uh, the Army at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and went to Huntsville, Alabama, um, that was my only health insurance was VA care. And uh, thankfully, the folks at the community-based out outpatient clinic uh, in Huntsville uh, took great care of me there, and I was able to, uh, you know, one night, um, due to what I think is burn pit exposure, I just couldn't breathe and was able to get in and see somebody that very next morning. As a manager, Larry Korb, um, let's talk about that promise that we make to people who now in a volunteer military, very different kettle of fish, they go in understanding the life they're entering, but also being told, on the other hand, here are, here's what you can expect for the rest of your life. Well, I think the point that has been made here <clears throat> by the Legion is that people were not being honest with General Shinseki. He was telling them to cut down the waiting period. All right. Now, people who did not want to admit they weren't following that or couldn't follow that were gaming the system by pretending people did. And that's a problem that we need to, you know, find, find out about, you know, and, and what was the reason that they were not able to do it. But, you know, as a manager, if you say, we're going to reduce the backlog by X or Y percent, people out in the field say, oh, we better do that or we won't get promoted or we won't get a, you know, a bonus or whatever it might be. And they're not as honest as they should be. And that's, I think, it, what we're finding out now. And that's why I think, you know, uh, General Shinseki said, I'm mad as hell. Because, you know, he's used to the Army where people don't do that, you know, usually. And I guess he just couldn't believe that people might do that. And we'll find out how bad. I mean, we heard a couple of whistleblowers. And, you know, that's why we have the inspector, inspector General looking at it. But the acting inspector general, when he testified, seemed to say it's not as bad as some people are claiming it to but be. But the Legion identified several top executives who collected sizable bonuses for hitting targets that it now appears they didn't hit. They gamed the system, and they should be held accountable for it. I, but you can't say, well, because people within the, you know, the system, you've got hundreds of thousands of employees, you know, do something they shouldn't. You've got to blame the person, you know, on the, on the top. Well, Louis Chelly, can you know if someone below you is lying to you? I, I, I certainly hope so, and I would certainly hope that I would know if the job wasn't getting done. And if, it, if the job wasn't getting done, I would have to root it back to, to find out where it wasn't getting done. And then when I was receiving answers telling me it was getting done, I mean, that's what leadership's all about. Who here is going to be held accountable? You can't hold the people who are lying accountable if you don't know they're lying. Then when you find out that they're lying, it's your fault. The, everything that happens or fails to happen in a military unit, as I'm sure both of, both of my, my uh, colleagues here know, is the result of the commander and the first sergeant. But what flows up to a man like Eric Shinseki is not guys in casts or holding MRI prescriptions, it's data. And if the data looks good, how are you supposed to know that it's not? Because going back to that point, yeah, the first sergeant and the commander, but you don't leave the chief of staff of the army if something is happening. I mean, look at the sexual assault problem the military's have. Well, we're not relieving the chiefs. We're looking at the commanders and the units. And yes, you should look at those people, but not the top person. It's very easy to, uh, to do that. So I agree, there's got to be accountable to the people who are in Phoenix or wherever ever it is. And going back to Ray's point, if they're telling them, 
that, you know, things are going well, the wait time, you know, there's several layers in between that should be checking on. That. I hear what you're saying, but for years on end, since 2010, at a minimum, Shinseki has heard. There have been memos that have been sent to him and the president explaining exactly what was going on, and yet nothing happened. And when he was asked about that memo today, said he didn't remember seeing it, yet his undersecretary, Petzl, said, yeah, I do remember that. So which is it? Is, is Petzl not informing the secretary? And after, after four years, is it... Is it his responsibility to know that this is how? Of course it is. Richard, hold that thought. I know you want to jump in there. <laughs> We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about whether this latest crisis is a, actually has the potential to break open the monopoly that the VA system holds in some kinds of care. This has been a politically fraught conversation in the past. What about the future? This is Inside Story. Welcome back to Inside Story. I'm Ray Suarez. We're continuing our conversation on the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. As of 2012, there were 22 million veterans in the United States. Eight and a half million are enrolled in the VA health care system. You often hear about the size of the bureaucracy. These numbers tell part of the story. There are 56 regional offices for benefit administration, 152 veterans administration hospitals, 300 veteran centers, 817 community-based outpatient clinics. Richard Allen Smith, you wanted to jump in before the break and, and answer to what you've been hearing. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, look, we're, we all agree that if people are gaming the system, that's wrong. If veterans are being hurt, that's wrong. But I think we would also all agree that access to care and quality of care is a lot better than it was in 2007, 2008, before General Shinseki took over. And I think it's important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. General Shinseki's done an amazing job at modernizing VA, and we need to keep him on board for that. And second, I want to point out that the Legion actually uh, supported an omnibus veteran spending bill that Republicans in Congress spiked. And that bill contained a lot of funding for new veter uh, medical center constructions and other things that would improve veterans' access to care. Um, so I think, you know, if we're going to talk about holding people accountable, let's hold the folks in Congress accountable that didn't put that funding forward. I want to alight quickly before we go on one issue that's come up from time to time. There have been veterans who've said, look, I can't travel to the nearest center. It's very inconvenient. Or people who've pointed out that providing things like colonoscopies or chest x-rays might be cheaper if you just did it in a portable clinic right near where you live in an already standing hospital in your neighborhood rather than traveling to a VA facility but that's often been scotched people have said no we've already got the infrastructure we've already had the systems in place could we see some rationalization of the way we use these resources save money and still deliver the medical care right? oh I, I agree that we should we need to you know given you know the way we communicate and the internet now yes you can do it and one of the problems they had, they haven't been able to hire enough doctors, even though the money's there, because the VA doesn't pay as well as people in private practice. So, no, I think we ought to do that. And then you ought to have the DOD, Department of Defense, and the Veterans Administration health care systems together, too. That would also help. Louis Jelly? I agree with that. And, and as far as remote care, you know, the VA has been instrumental in instituting rural care initiatives. They have telehealth. They have the C box. These are things that the American Legion has constantly lobbied for. And in addition to that, you talked a little bit about the uh, the cost. The VA is more cost effective than any other program. So, keeping the VA in place actually saves money. Just before we go, quick yes or no? Do you think uh, General Shinseki's job is in danger? Is he going to stay till the end of the administration? I certainly hope he does. I think VA is in great. I know pains. you hope he does. Is he? Yes. I think he will. I think after today, today he's gone. Really? I think he's gone. I think he had a shot. Today's performance before Congress, I, I don't think he had the answers that Congress was looking for. I think that he and Undersecretary Petzl came unprepared. Uh, I, was, I, I was embarrassed for him because he didn't have the answers that Congress was looking for on very simple questions like, is this a performance review that, that will earn them money? He said he didn't know. I just, I think that the administration's had it. That brings us to the end of this edition of Inside Story. Thanks for being with us. The program may be over, but the conversation continues. We want to hear what you think about the issues raised on this or any day's show. 
You can log on to our Facebook page. You can send us your thoughts on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story AM. You can reach me directly at Ray Suarez News. We'll see you for the next Inside Story. In Washington, I'm Ray Suarez.